on this special commercial free edition of the Fifth Estate. It was an attack that shattered a capital city and shook a nation. Somebody in uniform was yelling, get down, get down, get down. Harrowing tales from the people intimately connected to the tragedy. I was saying he was a good man and that he was a brave man. What prompted a gunman to murder a soldier in the shadow of the Peace Tower? And another man to kill a soldier in Quebec? What did police and security forces know about the mounting threats in Canada? They had a very clear awareness of what the risk might be in Ottawa and in other cities in Canada. What about the growing number of Canadians who export terror? Startling new revelations about one young man's journey to jihad. And what lessons can we learn from the past and the stories about terror we've told you on the Fifth Estate? Fighting the fear within. I'm Bob McKeown. This is the Fifth Estate. Wednesday, October 22nd, not long after 9 a.m. A clear fall morning in downtown Ottawa as the city begins another day of the nation's business. They didn't know it, but two very different men who'd never met were on a collision course. And both would soon be dead. One of them was Corporal Nathan Cirillo of Hamilton, a reservist with the Canadian Forces, chosen to be an honorary guard at the National War Memorial. Cirillo was 24, handsome and charismatic. The day before, a female visitor from California asked to have this picture taken with him and posted it online. It likely wasn't the first time. That morning, another young man from Quebec was also headed to the war memorial. He too considered himself to be a soldier. His photo would soon be posted on ISIS websites. It would be a few hours before most of us would first hear his name. Nathan Cirillo wanted a permanent military position, but sentries at the Cenotaph are mostly ceremonial. So on Wednesday, his rifle was empty. I decided to walk along Spark Street because it's just a nicer route, and I had my camera in my purse. Barbara Winters, a lawyer with the Federal Justice Department, was on her way to work when she noticed the guards. I thought, well, there's a nice picture. So I stopped and I took uh, two or three pictures of the gentleman standing guard, and um, then I carried on. And someone took this photo as well. Soon afterwards, Barbara Winters heard the shots. It was 10 minutes to 10. I heard the pop, pop, pop. Bystanders began to flee, but without concern for their own safety, Winters, a former military medic, and others ran towards the soldier who had been hit, Corporal Cirillo. It didn't look good. He wasn't speaking, no. Um, and he was lying with his eyes open, staring up at the sky. But all the while, Barbara Winters, here in the dark coat, kept reassuring him. And I made a point of to keep talking to him, but at some point I also had to do mouth to mouth. I think I, I, think I stroke, tried to stroke his forehead. Once the paramedics were, were coming, I. I just made a more concerted effort to, to get down and whisper in his ear. I was saying what I think he needed to hear. And that he was, um, I was saying he was a good man and that he was a brave man and that he was loved and that his parents were so proud of him. Crime scene. Can we please clear the crime scene? Don't compromise the crime scene. Please. When the paramedics arrived, the bystanders were still trying to keep the young soldier alive. 
you don't even think about it, right? You're just doing it. And time goes by fast. So every single person in that group had nothing on their mind, nothing but the welfare of that man. Nathan Cirillo was declared dead at the hospital. As the terrible news spread, the RCMP and Ottawa police descended on the war memorial, desperately searching for the shooter. You will get reports after on what is Guys, on there the is show? a shooter on the loose. Please move back. Please, we need you off the memorial. By piecing together video from various sources, this is the incredible route the shooter took trying to reach what apparently was supposed to be his next killing ground. Here he is, caught on amateur video, leaving the war memorial moments after the shooting, returning to the car he'd just abandoned in traffic. It's hard to see on this video, but remember, he's carrying a rifle. After a U-turn, he's now driving towards Parliament Hill and stops right next to the East Block. Watch these three men who've apparently been following the chaos across the street. One approaches the shooter's car, quite possibly sees the gun, and all three of them flee. Then, on this security video released by the RCMP, you can follow the shooter as he crosses the lawn, hijacks a car waiting for an MP, then abandons it in front of the center block and walks towards the steps that lead into Parliament. 9.50. I know the time because I was late for a meeting. Gretel Levy is a press secretary for the NDP. She and a friend happen to be leaving the building at that very same time. A guard or I don't, maybe a police officer, I'm not sure, somebody in uniform was yelling, get down, get down, get down, over and over. And we still stood there. And then someone, I don't know who, yelled, gun. And uh, that's when we got down on the ground. They were crouching next to the steps leading inside when she caught just a glimpse of his face. She says he had no expression at all, nothing that might attract attention. Nothing struck me. He just seemed like your average guy. But when she saw his rifle, she went into survival mode. I just reacted and put my head down, and then my mind went totally blank. I mean, I of course, I knew that's the ramp that goes right into the big, beautiful brass doors in the middle of the center block. At that moment, Gretel Levy realized two things, that behind those doors were some of Canada's most powerful people, including the prime minister and that someone was about to walk inside with a gun. On Parliament Hill Wednesday is caucus day, when party leaders meet with their troops in the center block. Wednesdays are a day when all the MPs gather for their caucus meetings, so we go because it's a good time to, to get them. Reporters like Josh Wingrove of The Globe and Mail come early to get quotes from the likes of Justice Minister Peter McKay. The topic of this day the killing of a Canadian soldier in Quebec by an apparent homegrown jihadi, ironically, just two days before. Terrorism was top of mind, obviously, in the aftermath of Monday. Josh Wingrove was around the corner from the center block entrance, writing his story, when he heard the bang. And I heard the first bang, and then came another bang, and subsequent ones. Screaming, and then put my head around the corner, and you could see smoke in the air, you could smell gunpowder, you could see guards with their guns drawn. Amidst all the chaos, Quebec MP Lisanne Blachette Lemoth had just returned from maternity leave. She had brought her newborn son to the caucus meeting and was breastfeeding him nearby when the shooting started. Everyone is yelling outside, and I didn't know what to do, so he just told me, hide, and, and I went in a little uh, phone booth, like one meter by one meter, really small thing, sit on the ground with the baby, and, and there I, I, I understood that there was something really wrong happening. Her fear was that if the baby began to cry, the person with the gun might find them. I just felt I need to keep him calm. I don't want him to panic because it would be worse. So when I thought about that, I just calmed down because, and, and I continued to breastfeed him in the little booth, in the dark. Go, 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 go,
It was about that time that Josh Wingrove turned on the video feature of his phone. It would be the definitive record of the armed attack on the Canadian Parliament. I mean, it was surreal. It just, it just happened so quickly. security force up this hall, known as the Hall of Honor. The way they're moving on the left is a room the Prime Minister is in. Be 200 senators and MPs in that room. And on the right is the NDP room. There'd be nearly 100 MPs in there. I mean, you know, but for a different turn, that could have been where things ended. The Conservatives had barricaded themselves inside the caucus room. British Columbia MP Bob Zimmer says they didn't know exactly what the threat was, but they resolved to do everything they could to fight it. You want to be there that if somebody's going to come in and try and hurt the people that are close to you, that you're not going to let them in easily. It was a sentiment shared by the parliamentary sergeant at arms, former RCMP officer Kevin Vickers during the gun battle outside the Library of Parliament had emptied his pistol at the gunman, later identified as 32-year-old Michael Zahaf Bibo. He died less than 10 minutes after he shot Nathan Cirillo. But outside, in Ottawa, confusion and fear continued. You have to leave! Now! As police moved to secure Parliament and the downtown core... No! Not right now. You see what we're doing. This is an ongoing operation. We are asking members of the public to stay away from the downtown core. For the next 10 hours, Parliament Hill in the center of the city would remain locked down, giving everyone time to reflect on how the life of Corporal Cirillo came to an end, what it all means, and if it might have been even worse. It, it just hits home how, how, how quickly things can change. And I'm, I'm tired and I'm, I'm sad. And it, it was a tragic day and I, I don't know yet really anything about this soldier that died. And I find myself really wanting to. You know, in life you don't get to say you're glad that you did something too often. But I'm really glad I did it. And I really hope he heard. Next, Gillian Finley looks at how the authorities ignored the warning signs. They had a high awareness of the kinds of threats that they faced. To anyone who saw him that morning, it must have been terrifying. The man with the gun and the deadly intent. But less than 72 hours after Mikhail Zehaf Bibo made that fateful sprint to the center block, the picture that's emerging is not of an ideological killer, but a man desperate. So desperate that three years ago he was begging to be sent to jail for his own protection. The plea came in a Vancouver court hearing that was recorded. We're not allowed to broadcast the audio tape, but the transcript shows Zihaf Bibo was insistent. I'm a crack addict, he told the judge. At the same time, I'm a religious person. I want to sacrifice freedom and good things for a year, maybe. So when I come out, I'll appreciate life more, and I'll be clean. It all happened in December 2011. Homeless and disturbed, he walked into a police station and confessed to an armed robbery he said he'd committed in Montreal 10 years earlier. He said he told them, just put me in so I can do my time. When they wouldn't, he says he warned them, if you don't put me in, I'm gonna do something else right now. And he did. Hours later, he was arrested after holding up a McDonald's, threatening the server with a pointed stick. In court, Zihaf Bibo told the judge he believed he suffered from an undiagnosed mental disorder. But in this handwritten note, the court-appointed psychiatrist disagreed. 
I'm unable to find any features or sign of a mental illness, the psychiatrist wrote. He was presumed fit to stand trial, and he did. The judge found him guilty, but one day later he was released, free to continue what was by then an increasingly erratic existence. His life didn't start badly. Born in a Montreal suburb, the only son of a Canadian mother and a father from Libya, Zihaf Bibo grew up in a comfortable neighborhood, a secular one, attended a Catholic private school. And yet neighbors still remember a young man who made them uneasy. Just the way he, he spoke to me, he wasn't, uh, he didn't come across friendly. His criminal life started early, drug charges mostly, and continued through stints in Calgary and eventually Vancouver. It's not clear when he decided to embrace Islam or why, but by 2011 he was a regular at this mosque in Burnaby, though he quickly earned a reputation as someone to stay clear of. Assam Rashid is the mosque spokesman. He was somebody of a, of a very transient nature. He was moving around. He did not have any stable family or work life. Um, he did have, as we know, uh, a history of substance abuse and uh, trouble with the, with the law. At one point, he ran afoul of the administration. He didn't like the fact the mosque was open to non-Muslims. He had a problem with that, and um, the administration sat him down and said, look, this is how we work. We would like to introduce people to Islam. We would like to uh, work on common issues with other communities, and in order for that to happen, we have to open our doors to them, and, and we don't plan on changing that policy anytime soon. If you have a problem with it, it's better you go somewhere else. There's absolutely nothing that would have led me to believe you would do this. But Dave Bathurst, an acquaintance during that time, says what Zahaf Bibo really needed was help. He basically was telling me that he feels that the devil's after him, and he's had a lot of experiences with the devil. He was uh, concerned that somehow, uh, I can't exactly word him, but I was coerced coercing him through, the devil was coercing him through me or, or something to that effect. You know, that's not something that uh, a balanced person would say. It wasn't long before he was back at the mosque again, this time making what some have identified as a fateful connection. This man, Hazibullah Yusuf Zai, also attended the mosque. He would become the first Canadian charged under the new anti-terrorism law for allegedly traveling to Syria to join Islamic fighters. It's believed he is still there. The RCMP didn't confirm a connection between the two, but they did say Zahaf Bibo had at least one link to someone they were concerned about. I might as well tell you that this individual's email was found in the hard drive of someone who we've charged uh, with a terrorist-related offense. What does that mean? We need to understand what that means. Uh, uh, and so when we say a connection, it is a sort of, a, you know, the weakest of connections. Uh, clearly, given what's happened, it's uh, strengthened by what's happened. What did happen in Ottawa on that terrible, awful day is what intelligence and security communities had been worrying about for weeks. It was almost like you were watching a playbook unfold. These are exactly the kinds of attacks that authorities in Canada, in the United States, and in England have feared uh, from supporters of ISIS. Richard Esposito is head of investigations for NBC News in New York. Two weeks ago, he reported what his Canadian intelligence sources were telling him, that would-be terrorists had been overheard discussing possible attacks in Canada among the potential targets soldiers. Um, they had a high awareness of the kinds of threats that they faced, a high awareness of the kinds of public iconic buildings that could be a place people were interested in attacking, the kinds of uniform personnel that people could be interested in attacking. So in that sense, they had a very clear awareness of what the risk might be in Ottawa and in other cities in Canada. The first soldier to die wasn't in Ottawa, but two days earlier in saint jean sur richelieu Warrant officer Patrice Vincent, run over by this man, Martin Couture-Rouleau, 
also a recent convert to Islam. Neighbors described how Martin morphed into Ahmed in the last year thanks to a new community he discovered online. His uh, personality has changed uh, very much. Uh, uh, I know that uh, he chat with the, uh, with the uh, Islamists. But Kuturulo was also deeply troubled. 25 years old, unemployed, in a dissolving relationship. And according to one Facebook friend in Saudi Arabia, worrying that he was about to lose his young son. He, him and his wife were not really close. Yeah, and he was trying actually to take custody over his son. According to court documents, he was also facing bankruptcy. Just last week, he filed an affidavit in which he described his newfound religion as a personal thing, swearing he had no intention of imposing his beliefs on anyone. But that's not how Richard Esposito sources describe him. I think the man who ran down the soldiers with the car is without a doubt linked to other people who the Canadian government has had an interest in. He says they describe the link as tangential. They have common interests. They talk about, you know, why they support ISIS, for example. Um, but they're not necessarily active. They share the same beliefs to some degree, perhaps. They know the same people. So I'm confident that authorities um, in the U.S. and Canada feel that way, yes. The day after Couture-Rouleau killed the warrant officer outside Montreal and was killed himself, the RCMP confirmed it was indeed monitoring him as a potential threat. They had revoked his passport last July and in a rare display of transparency revealed that for four months they had been working with Couture-Rouleau and his family trying to change his thinking. And then we saw him the last time on October 9th. Uh, that's when we had a long discussion with him, and when he showed some uh, intention of uh, uh, wanting to change a bit and, and try to improve and, and, um, and do more things than uh, just going and travel. Was there more that could have been done? They'll never know. It's difficult to, um, to, to do more uh, because we could not arrest someone for thinking uh, for having radical thoughts. It's not a crime in Canada. But if police couldn't stop the Montreal killer who was on their radar, how could they ever hope to stop the guy they'd never heard of before? Someone like the Ottawa killer, Mikhail Zihafibo. We didn't know uh, that this individual uh, was in Ottawa, uh, had that intention. And of course, uh, had we have known that, we all would have acted on that. He was what intelligence experts like to call a lone wolf. Quiet, deadly, and almost impossible to track, unlike 20 or 30 years ago before the internet. But it was a more uh, visible type of thing. You found a group, you monitored their activity, you know who were members of it, and so forth. Now, with the lone wolf, it could really be anybody. Jeffrey Simon wrote a book, Lone Wolf Terrorism. In many important ways, he says Zahaf Bibo fit the profile, which is why stopping him was always going to be difficult. It is very difficult to separate who's just venting and who's just, you know, doing a social media thing for the sake of it and those who actually are going to follow through with a terrorist attack. For some who work in Canada's spy agency, if you can't separate them in the cyber world, you're probably better off focusing on the real world. Jeffrey O'Brien is a former CSIS director. Unless we lived in a totally, a total surveillance society, the authorities would never be in the position to, as you say, pick up that lone wolf. So what you then rely on, I think, is other things. You rely on physical protection. You rely on, in, in Britain, I suppose, you could say they rely on CCTV cameras, which appear to be everywhere in Britain. Watching Zahaf Bibo on the Ottawa closed circuit TV, you can feel the security guard's frustration. He was right there, gun in full view. Having committed murder in broad daylight, he penetrated the symbolic heart of our democracy, up the drive, right to the door, and across the threshold. 
He, of course, had no idea how little time he had to live. Perhaps we should have known that he or someone like him would be coming, given what Canada had done just two weeks before. Get out of here. It was October 7th. The vote was to join the U.S.-led coalition against the Islamic State. Within days, ISIS propaganda named Canada specifically as a country that should brace for retaliation. And yet, the threat level on Parliament Hill remained the same as it had for years, and still didn't change even when intelligence sources in both the U.S. and Canada made it clear how worried they were. That's according to NBC's Richard Esposito. There was a very conscious decision trying to be made among your political class as to whether we're going to tell the Canadian people we have a higher level than we've had before, since 9-11, of threat. And I guess no one decided to make that, uh, take that step. Who knows whether it would have made a difference? whether a heightened sense of danger might have heightened public vigilance around the war memorial, whether a more robust police presence would have hindered that fateful journey up the hill. Today, the threat level has been raised across the country. An extra 250 officers reassigned to help monitor those Canadians the RCMP fears the most. We are wiser after this week, but safer? That will always be the question. Coming up next, exporting terror. Mark Kelly with new revelations about the latest young Canadian man promoting his violent exploits abroad on the web. They told me you have but one life, so make the most out of it. There is but one death, so prepare for it. For many young Western men, this is where they complete their conversion to the cause, the armed struggle in the battlefields of the Middle East, by burning their passports and pledging their allegiance to the Islamic State. And few have done it so publicly, so provocatively, than Calgary's Farah Mohammed Shirdan. And all the American Tawaqeet, we are coming and we will destroy you, bidnillahi ta'ala. That may have sounded like rebel bluster a few weeks ago, but in the wake of the attack in Ottawa, it now has Canada on high alert. The RCMP says there are currently more than 90 people in Canada considered high-risk travellers who have shown an interest in going to the battle zones in places like Iraq and Syria. Officials estimate 130 Canadians are now fighting abroad, at least 30 in Syria. This is the story of one of them. His story has never been told before. Along with our colleagues at the Radio Canada program Enquête, we bring you a Montreal man's journey to jihad. His name is Sami. He's 26 years old, and he's now in Syria, learning how to kill. This is where he's arrived on his journey. We wanted to know where it began. He grew up in a comfortable Montreal suburb. His Quebec-born mother and Syrian-born father split when he was young. He lived with his dad. He went to this high school, where former classmates remember little about him. His yearbook entry, a blank slate. But Sammy would come to the attention of police when he was in his early 20s. He was charged and convicted in the brutal beating of another man. The judge speculated it was all connected to a drug deal. Sammy was good at keeping his personal life private, but he would find his voice on social media, where the quiet kid from Montreal left a huge footprint. His own postings reveal that his brush with the law came at a time in his life when he was also finding religion. There are signs of his embracing Islam on his Twitter feed and Facebook page, and his fervor only grew as he combined his deepening faith with the power of the Internet, 
which quickly became his pulpit. I say those of you who see something wrong must write it. On Facebook, he's linked to several mosques in and around Montreal, including this suburban prayer room. Our colleagues from Radio-Canada went there, and that's where they met this man. He didn't want his identity revealed, but did agree to talk about Sammy. He wasn't religious when he was younger. It happened later, when he was an adult, and that's when he began to change. On his Twitter feed, Sammy preached about his newfound faith. Islam shouldn't be something trendy. It should be a way of life. He then began to make Islam his way of life, changing his on-screen name to El Sami and Abu Safwan El Kanadi, or the Canadian. He posted this on Facebook in March 2013. They told me you have but one life, so make the most out of it. But I responded, there is but one death, so prepare for it. But was someone preparing him? Was he being recruited? Last year, as the fight against Bashar al-Assad's brutal regime in Syria intensified, the call went out to more foreigners to join the rebel cause. Sami was ready to commit to one of the most extreme rebel groups, according to his friend. He was communicating with people, but I don't know who they were. They were in contact online. In 2013, Sami was in trouble with the law again, charged with assault. He was supposed to appear in court, but he never showed up. An arrest warrant was issued, but he was never found until this. Weeks later, on his Facebook page, a picture of Istanbul, Turkey. Turkey is a gateway for foreign fighters who slip across the border to join the battle for control of Syria. Sami's journey to jihad, like many other Canadians before him, was now underway. Murtaza Hussein is a Canadian journalist who tracks the jihadi movement and groups like ISIS, the Islamic State. He's communicated online with some of the foreign fighters who have joined their ranks. I know it's a small group of Westerners that have been attracted to this, but is there a commonality from what you've seen, a pattern that you've seen? The, the commonality I've seen is a lot of these guys have criminal histories which are unrelated to religion or politics at all, like in drug involvement, violent crimes, and they seem to come to Islam later in their life, and it's something which, and from their involvement in Islam, they seem to go very quickly into this other sort of radicalized version. And that version is slick and sophisticated. Long gone are the grainy images of Osama bin Laden in a cave. The appeal to jihad is now tailored to the young, by the young. Take a look at this jihadi version of the popular video game Grand Theft Auto, where in this version, U.S. soldiers are the prey. They've created uh, movie trailers, they've created video game trailers, drawing on Grand Theft Auto and other things. ISIS is a movement of people who, in many stances, grew up in the West, and they're part of this uh, postmodern culture we have here. So they're able to speak to Westerners and kids here in a way that Al-Qaeda never could. Though groups like ISIS may reject the trappings of Western life, they do embrace the Internet as a powerful platform. My name is Abu Muslim. I'm your brother in Islam here in Syria. I originally come from Canada. It was a Canadian who was chosen to be featured in this ISIS recruitment video, believed to be the first to be produced yeah, in English. I was like any other regular Canadian. I watched hockey, I went to the cottage in the summertime, I love to fish. It's a call to arms from André Poulain, a native of Timmins, Ontario, and a convert to Islam. The video is called The Chosen Few of Different Lands. So it's not like I was some social outcast, uh, it wasn't like I was some anarchist or somebody who just wants to destroy the world and kill everybody. No, I was a regular person. It's part of a jihadi online offensive to convince Westerners to leave their dull lives behind them and embrace a higher calling, just like Sammy. There's a role for everybody. Every person 
can contribute something to the Islamic State. Many people will join because they have some sort of frustration in society, but you know, a lot of what ISIS offers is what these uh, transnational movements or gangs have offered throughout history, which is a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, a sense of camaraderie and belonging. Well, someone like Andre Poulain, I would say that he maybe saw a life which is greater than a stable, boring life in suburban Canada to be a great hero in Syria, although, you know, I think we most would argue that it was not a very heroic choice he made in the end. Poulain would end up dead, his corpse one of the last images in this ISIS video. And though the jihadi soldiers are dying by the thousands in Iraq and Syria, there are more recruits ready to join. Just this March, Sammy, the man from Montreal, was posting pictures and boasting about his battles as a member of al-Nusra, one of the key rebel groups fighting the al-Assad regime in Syria. Along with ISIS, the rebel acts of brutality have shocked the Western world. Sammy then posts a list of town after town he claims the rebels have taken. Throughout these battles, Sammy's constantly changing his profile pictures, illustrating his new life as a rebel fighter. His conversion to the cause is clearly complete. Should Canadians care about this idea of, of young Canadians going to fight over there? Not everyone necessarily goes to take part in a foreign conflict as a terrorist. Having said that, people who seem to evince this very radical and chauvinistic ideology, they're going to victimize that population. They're not going to help them. And as Canadians, it's our duty to make sure that our citizens don't go abroad and hurt people in this way. Back in Canada, the two men who spread terror as they spilled blood this week also wanted to be recruits. The mother of Michael Zehaf Bibo says her son told her he wanted to go to Syria to fight. And Martin Couture-Rouleau was stopped by the RCMP as he tried to board a flight to Turkey this summer. That's when his passport was seized. But Sammy, like many other Canadians who got away, thumbs his nose at Canada's security officials, most notably the spy agency CSIS. CSIS is in reality BS. They live off Canadian taxes and spend their time hanging around neighborhood mosques or young people's Facebook accounts. They're a bunch of incompetent clowns. In August, Sammy's Facebook account was closed. He's still believed to be in Syria, and if he ever did come back to Canada, he could be charged under the Combating Terrorism Act. In one of his last postings, Sammy poses in a luxury hotel room in a Syrian town he says was captured by his rebel group, eager for the next fight. We battled for almost a week to take this town, and now we've gathered at this hotel to prepare our attack on the village nearby. Up next, the lessons from the global wave of terror, from the stories we've told on the Fifth Estate. They always take us by surprise. The acts of terror by people most of us have never heard of. Our responses rarely vary. Who was he? Or who are they? What on earth possessed them? I'm Lyndon McIntyre. There's a chilling continuity that links the terrible events of this week with epic acts of violence in the recent past. We've tried to tell the stories, struggling to understand the motivation behind each gruesome crime. How and why disappointed, disillusioned people latch onto extreme religious doctrines, become fanatics, and ultimately murderers. Whether on a small stage, a parking lot in Zhenjiang, Quebec, or at a monument in Ottawa, or on a global scale that changes how we see the world and how we live. He was known to friends and family as a cool guy, modern, 
loved to dance, loved to drink. But on the eve of the atrocity that would define decades of the 21st century, nobody knew the real Ziad Jarrah. Even as he partied with his family, he had begun a deadly transformation. And on the 11th of September, 2001, he became a mass murderer. Part of a terror team that hijacked airplanes in America. His would crash in a farmer's field in Pennsylvania. Nothing left but a gaping hole and a mystery that would perplex the world and no one more than the members of a family to whom he had become an alien. His roots were here, Lebanon's Beka Valley. He was scheduled to return here to be married. His father's wedding gift, a new Mercedes, awaited his arrival. When we met his uncle, Jamal, in the weeks immediately after 9-11, he was in a state of hopeful disbelief. There is nothing that you could lead you to suspect that Ziad could be connected with this. Anything political in about him? Uh, he never cared about politics. Religion? No. He wasn't interested? He was, interested. He was not interested in religion. His ambitious, um, the, the kind of sociable one who wants to to get to know everybody, to socialize with everyone. He was a happy boy. The change from happy boy to ruthless killer started far away from Lebanon. But even as he left his homeland in 1996, he was the same carefree Ziad to his family and his friends. Hamburg, Germany. Hamburg had a Muslim population of 100,000 people. A small minority felt alienated, hostile to European values. But Ziad wasn't one of them at first. He seemed to fit in. Religious Muslims regarded him as wishy-washy about his faith. He even had a girlfriend, Aysel Sangun. She was of Turkish background and like Jarrah, she was indifferent about religion. He lived here, rented a room from a widow for whom Ziad was almost family, Rosemary Canal. You liked him. He was a nice boy. Yes. Yeah, ja, I mochte him very gern. Uh -huh. We verstanden uns sehr gut. Over time, though, he would change, become mysterious. He'd spend weekends in a Hamburg suburb, Harburg. He'd take a train to this railway station. From here, he'd walk or take a taxi, the short distance to a house known as a hangout for an extremist clique, led by a grim Egyptian named Mohammed Atta. People who cared about him became worried. His landlady and his girlfriend, Isol, who told Rosemarie that his newfound piety was getting in the way of their relationship. What, what did she tell you about his his religion? Und dann äh, sagte er erzählte sie mir eben, dass sie eben äh, ähm, gemerkt hat, dass er jetzt sehr viel mehr betete. Und mm -hmm. das erstaunte sie und mm -hmm. äh, konnte sich das aber auch nicht erklären. Und he was he was ja. becoming more religious. Er betet mehr. Ja, 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 ja. Und er zöge sich auch manchmal so einen so einen Überwurf an. Das hat er auch zu Anfang nie gemacht. Und dann hatte er mir jetzt letzten Weihnachten schenkte er mir schenkte er mir einen deutschen Koran. In the fall of 1999, he dropped out of sight, abandoned his studies, and he began the final transformation that would lead to this. A transformation that even 13 years later, no one can explain with any certainty. From callow youth to political fanatic to callous killer. In the aftermath of 9-11, its epic scale and global impact, the backlash against Islamic extremism, the invasions of Afghanistan, Iraq, it was tempting to believe that even the fanatics were reconsidering their tactics 
but it would soon be clear that the grievances behind the acts of terror were deeply rooted, and they'd soon bear bitter fruit in Europe. Atocha Station. This is the heart of Madrid. March 11, 2004, at 7.30 in the morning, as four trains converged on the crowded platforms, of coordinated bombs, 191 people dead, 1,800 injured. In the aftermath, familiar questions. Who? Why? How? Three weeks later on, on the outskirts of Madrid, police would corner seven radicals they believed to be the bombers. But again, the world would be left to speculate about the motivation of the perpetrators. Barricaded in a second floor apartment, they dressed in white robes of martyrdom, phoned friends, drank water from Mecca, chanted Quranic verses, then blew themselves up. Less than a year later, July 7, 2005, in London, the now familiar images, the aftermath of violence that always seems to catch the public by surprise, calculated to kill and terrorize, to make a point the perpetrators rarely bother to explain. Finsbury Park, north of London. The mosque here had become a hotbed of extremist propaganda. The radical imam who ran it went to jail, only to be replaced by an equally militant leader, a British-born convert named Abu Abdullah, who preaches that Islam is in a war of self-defense that justifies extreme responses. They are waging war on Islam because they cannot have full global domination until they completely eradicate Islam. And he didn't have to look beyond the daily news in 2005 to fuel his belief that the Western world, led by the United States and Britain, were in a war against Islam. Invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq seemed to substantiate the apocalyptic view that Islam was under siege. The response, a call for militant jihad, which only caused the politicians in the West to dig in deeper. We will finish the historic work of democracy in Afghanistan and Iraq so those nations can light the way for others and help transform a troubled part of the world. Stirring words in America, but for serious analysts in Europe, it was all naive bravado. When you listen to our American friends, building a nation is like uh, spending a weekend to improve your tennis style or your golf thing, and it's not like that, you know. It was a message that resonated in unexpected places, even with a former head of a CIA section dedicated to tracking and killing those responsible for 9-11, Michael Scheuer. We're being attacked because of what we do, not because of who we are, and by refusing to talk about that, I'm afraid uh, the American people, at least, don't have a good idea of just how dangerous the threat is that we face. We have not destroyed Al-Qaeda, so we still have that to worry about. We have its traditional allies, the groups that are operating now in Iraq. And now we have a third uh, tier of threat amongst the, the Muslims that live in the West and who are inspired to do something against the West by the example of the other two tiers. Toronto, June 2006. If Canadians felt immune to what seemed to be a global trend, complacency was about to be disturbed. 
Toronto the good suddenly seemed like all the other places in the world where bad things happen. Young Toronto area Muslims were anything but radical, but secret agents had been watching some of them for nearly four years. They lived in homes like this one, were nurtured in the spacious comforts of suburbia. Eighteen of them were accused of plotting terrorist attacks on targets in Toronto and Parliament and politicians, including the Prime Minister. Unlike 9-11, unlike Madrid and London, this conspiracy would go nowhere. This one was tightly monitored from the outset and in the end would be dismantled by a member of their own generation, their own community. Mubin Sheikh got wind of it. Newly radicalized young men were plotting something. He knew where they were coming from. He related to their piety and understood their anger. But he also knew where it would lead. I'm a fundamentalist, man. I'll put the, the fun in fundamentalist. Just because I'm all for Sharia law doesn't mean I'm all for blowing up buildings in downtown Toronto. Mubin Sheikh could easily have been one of them. He fit the profile. He was into martial arts. He admired the military. A tough guy in the gym and on the streets. He'd been into drugs and booze, but became disillusioned with the pointless fun. Like, I've done it all. Acid, mushrooms, like, I got five tattoos, 12 self-inflicted cigarette burns. Uh, I'm all sober doing all this. Then a moment of epiphany. I got burned out. That's what happened. The fast lane was too slow. I was living in the passing lane. And, uh, you know, when you're going at that speed and that intensity, you burn out, you know. So I mean, a, a Christian would say you were born again. Yeah, can you identify with that? I can relate to it, um, the concept of born again. And I understand it in the Christian context. And it's similar in the Islamic context in that there was a reawakening. A reawakening that could easily have gone the other way. He could have been corrupted by the internet images that hijacked the minds of 18 young people in Toronto. Instead, he worked with law enforcement agencies to stop them. But he understands the outrage of extremists. Let's admit that there's a problem. Yeah, we're interfering in people's countries a little too much. We're imposing our way of life on people a little too much. People tend not to like that. And so kids who are here, they see that and they see, look, you know what? My government is being hostile to my people. So it's very easy for this person to say, you know what? I will reciprocate the hostility. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the phrasing there. My, my government is being hostile to my people. Right. Even though your people live in yeah. a country you've never seen. Exactly. Don't speak the language, I may not, but I know that they're Muslim and that's enough for me. Right? And with the, again, adding those factors, the variables of youth, anger, prone to anger, prone to irrationality, that's just, that's a powder keg waiting to be lit. You have been watching a special edition of The Fifth Estate. And now we're going to change the channel to a happier topic. We recently had some great news from New York. Our show was awarded an international Emmy. In fact, the fifth Emmy of Fifth Estate history. Call it a nice birthday surprise as we enter our 40th season. And since that first episode back in 1975, we've had hundreds of shows and thousands of stories and we'd like to treat you to some of our favorites, the ones that had huge impact, often changed lives. So each week on our website, we'll feature a new show from our archive. And to kick it off, here's an excerpt from the very early days of the Fifth Estate. Under code names like MK Ultra, the CIA spent 25 years and $25 million on secret mind control research. Brainwashing could be a powerful ideological weapon and the U.S. had to have it. And when the agency didn't undertake its own studies, it funded someone else's. Thus, the search for mind control brought MKUltra to Canada, to Montreal. The largest MKUltra research project, this one directly related to brainwashing, was carried out at the university's psychiatric hospital, the Allen Memorial Institute. Located atop Mount Royal, in a mansion with the eerie name of Ravenscrag, 
the Allen Memorial was once the most prestigious mental hospital in Canada. The unorthodox treatments of its director caught the attention of the CIA in the mid-50s. Dr. Ewan Cameron, the first director of the Allen Memorial, ran the institute with an iron hand for 20 years. Patients came to the Allen Memorial Institute from all across Canada. Dr. Ewan Cameron, it was said, would give them the best psychiatric care money could buy. But some of the patients had no idea that a lot of their treatment, the LSD, the massive doses of electric shock, the sleep therapy, was highly experimental. You can find that entire show on our website. But every Friday night, we will continue to bring you the very best of investigative journalism today, here on the Fifth Estate. In fact, my colleagues are in the field right now, preparing these stories. Jillian Findlay reports on a Canadian journalist convicted and caged in Cairo. It's a political case. We are political prisoners. Mohammed is being treated as a terrorist, as a terrorist in Egypt. Mark Kelly investigates the mysterious disappearance of a young woman in British Columbia. To everyone, from dead Emma. Good luck, every heart. I love you, Ben. I think it's a very unfortunate thing to be born that beautiful. And she said, I want to come home. And I said, absolutely, honey. You can always come home. You're, you always have a home. Lyndon McIntyre goes inside a police interrogation room where the truth doesn't stand a chance. I just went to a party. Somebody was you know killed. That's and here I am. Gonna... What was your first clue that maybe you and the police officer are not exactly on the same side of that discussion? After about the third hour, the only choice was to tell the police exactly what they wanted to hear. And I'll have the story of a deadly ignition defect that General Motors kept secret. What happened to this GM car? Crappy little cobalt. And we'll ask whether Ottawa was asleep at the switch while Canadian lives were lost. It's incumbent upon the manufacturer to let Transport Canada know about a defect in a timely fashion. That's right. Is it almost a decade and a half in timely fashion? And that's our program for this week. For Gillian Findlay, Mark Kelly, Lyndon McIntyre, and everyone here at the Fifth Estate, thank you for watching. I'm Bob McEwen. We'll see you soon. Thank you.